Um, uh, about three years ago, we started talking about uh, what we were trying to do with this institution long term. And, uh, for those of you that don't know much about the institution, um, our claim to fame is essentially to be the number one, undisputed number one school in the world for entrepreneurship, uh, according to all substantive major media that exists in the world. So uh, for US News and World Report, at the undergrad level, we're number one for, uh, for 16 years, at the undergrad level, at the grad level for 19 years. We've been number one at the undergrad level at, uh, at uh, Business Week uh, for all of the years that they've published uh, magazines. Uh, at both the undergrad and the grad level. Uh, and Princeton Review Entrepreneur Magazine um, actually saw the light this year uh, and also ranked us number one at the undergrad and grad level, what we affectionately call kind of the, uh, the academic triple crown. Uh, but, you know, your media is pretty fleeting and it's pretty dangerous to actually put your stock uh, in magazines that are disappearing at an ever rapid rate. Um, and uh, and uh, the notion that one of them might actually just decide to make us number two uh, just because it might sell a magazine is a, a deep fear for a president um, who, if we were number two, probably wouldn't be president. Uh, and so we started to say, what else can we do? And uh, we began to understand all of the dynamics of competitive strategy in higher education uh, and, uh, and listened and learned very carefully um, to another disciple of competitive strategy other than Michael Porter, for those of you that are burdened with a business education. Uh, there's another one called Jerry Garcia, and Jerry Garcia is not only a strategic consultant, but also was the leader of the Grateful Dead. And uh, when interviewed about the phenomena known as the Grateful Dead, um, and how they managed to actually be so long-lived and so powerful, he said, well, it's not our looks, and it's not our songwriting, and it's not our musicianship. In fact, it's because we were the only group that ever took their fans seriously from beginning to end. And those of you who are old enough to remember the phenomenon of deadheads understand when everybody else was busily charging you for music, uh, they had special sections up front where you could all take your eight-track tape recorders in. Uh, and record, and they actually built a computer platform to enable you to actually trade in tapes without any revenue coming to that group. Uh, and he essentially said, why bother trying to be the best when you can be the only? And if it's good enough for the Grateful Dead, it's good enough for Babson College. And uh, so we're the only school that does what we do, which is why, in God's name, we're doing this. I mean, you'll think about that, and you'll spend some time this afternoon, and hopefully you'll spend some time around here uh, over the next couple of days and get a much deeper appreciation of that. Uh, and how do we end up being the only school that does what we do is really very simple. We're the only school that really has identified entrepreneurship as a method. Most of you have the opportunity to engage in reading magazines, books, and watching television shows about Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and you understand that there's some sort of genetic mutation that creates entrepreneurs. Uh, we have this naive notion that entre entrepreneurship is a method, okay? It relies exclusively on practice uh, and that we can teach anybody to think and act more entrepreneurially than they do today and that that's in fact a good thing for the world. And so our faculty have really been involved in defining that method called entrepreneurial thought and action. We understand that the method cuts across a much broader array of phenomena than merely startups. Again, the literature has you believing the only thing in the world that entrepreneurs do is start up companies, attract venture capital, get rich, uh, and, uh, and move on. Uh, and uh, the reality of is this method applies to startups. It applies to high impact growth opportunities that really are the source of job creation in the world. I know for the last six to nine months, you've been engaged in incredible amounts of debate uh, about where new jobs come from. I can assure you they don't come from presidential campaigns. Um, the reality of it is all entrepreneurship is local and mayors and governors have tons more responsibility for job creation uh, than presidential candidates, but that doesn't make for interesting television right now. Um, uh, we also understand that family enterprise has an opportunity uh, to really ensure uh, the succession of families in those, uh, in those businesses in new, exciting, and entrepreneurial ways. Uh, and family enterprise has more wealth concentration attached to it than all of the public companies in the world combined. We tend to ignore that. Uh, and also, by the way, has the opportunity to take the long view in ways that public companies find it very difficult to take, particularly around being able to balance economic, social, uh, and sustainability-oriented outcomes. Many of the things we'll be talking about here in Food Day. 
Also, obviously, the opportunity to revitalize large companies through entrepreneurial activity. Most of us actually have this negative stereotype uh, that essentially says it is systematically incapable to get materially large innovation and entrepreneurship in large companies, and that they're, in fact, hostile uh, to entrepreneurial activities. But now they're, in fact, desperate for them. Uh, the half-life of a company in the Fortune 25 is about 10 years. Right? And so uh, the spin in that cycle dictates in so many different ways the need to figure out ways to be substantially more entrepreneurial, and we're involved in that. And then finally, we're involved in social innovation. And in large part, the ability to use entrepreneurial thought and action across a broad platform, set of platforms to be able to think seriously uh, about the food system and the food supply in the world is a perfect example uh, of what we do at Babson and what makes us the only school that does what we do. So we do that across all those platforms. We call that entrepreneurship of all kinds. And then we have one other reason that we do what we do and we're the only school that does what we do. And that's because we do it for the world. Entrepreneurship is the most powerful force for economic and social value creation that exists on the face of the earth. And our ability to use a method and to use that method across a broader context is, in fact, uh, a way in which this little school 14 miles away from Boston that many of you are here for uh, for the first time is strikingly unlike any other school in the Boston Metroplex and, in fact, any other school in the world. So welcome to Babson and welcome to Food Day. And we're thrilled to have with us this afternoon Andrew Zimmern, our own entrepreneur in residence, uh, joined by six leading Boston area chefs and food entrepreneurs. But before getting started, I want to express our appreciation to First Republic Bank for sponsoring this fireside chat. Lance Mackey, who's the managing director, is with us this afternoon, and I'd like him to say a few words on behalf of the bank. So, Lance. As you know, I'm Lance Mackey. I'm a managing director with First Republic. Very excited to be here today, and everyone with us at First Republic is excited to be here today. Uh, we've been in Wellesley for five months now with great success, uh, and we're a San Francisco-based bank, which many of you may know of. Uh, we're delighted to support tonight's program hosted by Babson's Entrepreneur in Residence, Andrew Zimmer's, Zimmerman. You might say the Babson and the entre entrepreneurial spirit are part of the fabric of our company. Our CEO, Jim Herbert, is a 1966 graduate of Babson College. He holds this college very dear to his heart. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight for this, but uh, I'm sure he'll be here on future events. We also are fortunate enough to have many distinguished chefs in vineyards as our clients. We fancy ourselves as the food and wine bank, which two of my favorite things. Uh, and we offer many sponsorships in, the, in this area. So it is with my context that we look forward to hearing from the distinguished Mr. Zimmerman and the local innovators of the world of food. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Also with us today from First Republic Bank is Mary Beth Mahoney, a Babson alum, who's with the bank's new office in Wellesley. So Mary Beth, where are you? There you are. OK, great to have you. And then Mark Montaneri, Masters 86, and a parent of a new student, class of 2016, who's the deputy managing director of the Boston office. And where are you, Mark? Go Babson. OK, great. So the renewed, renowned food entrepreneurs that are here with us represent the importance of entrepreneurship of all kinds, and its far-reaching significance and impacts in the food arena. They've all been in the trenches together. You can't imagine what it's like having them all together in the green room, OK, and what they're saying. It's really pretty cool. Starting their own businesses and their own brands and establishing a presence in the restaurant and in the food, food world. And they all care deeply about the environment. They all care about sustainability. They all care about local sourcing. And they all care about developing new models for a better and more healthful food system. And with Andrew's influence, Babson's brought these thought leaders on food to campus uh, so that they can share their insights and perspectives with the entire Babson community and with our new friends. Now, many of you probably know by now that Andrew is a chef, he's an author, he's a teacher, he's a businessman, and he's a TV personality. Right? All of those things? Have I missed anything? A couple. OK. <laughs> what else would you like us to say about That's you? It's good. It's good enough. Yeah, it's good. Also, he's humble. So Andrew, February is going to be a year since you've been an entrepreneur in residence. 
and you've generated enormous buzz at Babson. This is the only entrepreneur at residence that I am now the ability to grant the authority to designate him as an entrepreneur in residence for tenure. Okay? And all you have to do is keep coming back for another 5,000 years. <laughs> he does Twitter meetings. He does Facebook chats. He has virtual Skype office hours. And he's done incredible work guiding our students and alums. And as a result of the guidance that he's provided to our team at Futsal and our students, we are jam-packed every single Tuesday at our community table with students who want to get involved in the food space. We are grateful to Andrew and his friends for being with us today and for all the energy that all of you bring to the array of issues associated with food. And we can't wait to hear the conversation that you're about to have. Andrew, I'm going to ask you to introduce your friends. Michelle Nishan, Skip Bennett, Jamie Bissonette, Tim and Nancy Cushman, and Todd Herberline. For those of you that don't live in the Boston area, to have the presence of all of these talented chefs and food entrepreneurs on the same stage is a really big deal. <laughs> to have them on the same stage at Babson College is mind-numbingly exciting. <laughs> and so now I'm going to turn the program over to Andrew and leave the rest of the program to our food, food experts. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Zimmer. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Hello, everyone. How you doing? How is everybody this afternoon, early evening? Awesome. So am I. It's been already a very busy and very exciting day. We had a wonderful faculty lunch, uh, followed by a, uh, a round table. Um, over at uh, Olin just uh, a few hours ago that was just really exciting and the type of conversation that normally uh, after a couple of hours everybody is is thrilled but excited to move on to the next thing and nobody wanted it to end and I think we're going to have the same uh, experience this afternoon here in the round table and again uh, at dinner tonight for those of you that are coming to uh, the evening event and of course tomorrow we have a full slate of activities so I hope for everyone you're going to avail yourself of this and this is the only thing that you are participating in uh, at the college uh, for food days please put a big circle around the calendar it happens every October 24th and I can guarantee you that we're doing something bigger and better next year onward so without any further ado I would like to thank uh, Rachel at Project Soul and Cheryl and all of her team at the Lewis Institute and Len and everybody at the college for uh, having us here this evening. And I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Um, this is going to be a fairly informal conversation and I'm going to hopefully ask some fairly thought-provoking questions, uh, lob in a few softballs, allow my friends to take some chops, hit some balls over the fence in preparation for the riveting, scintillating, and laser-like intellect that will be represented by the question and answer session by you people. So think of some good ones. Uh, Todd Haberlein is the chef at Volante Farms. Um, he has cut his teeth in kitchens all across California. And as he recently said at a farm dinner at Volante, and this is a quote, I've worked in restaurants all over the country. I've even done the Emmys, but nowhere is better than here. This is where I belong on the farm. Todd Haberlein. How you doing? I had, a, I had a chance to tour Volante Farms uh, this morning when I arrived from Minnesota, and it really is very impressive. If you're not living around here and don't know where it is, uh, on your way out of here, Google it and swing by. Uh, who's next? Tim and Nancy Cushman, friends of mine now for five, six, seven years, something like that. Uh, they own a restaurant in Boston that I had, I don't know, for at least five years, every year I would write the same column on my blog saying, this is the best restaurant in America that not enough people are talking about. It's a little place called Oya. Uh, Tim is the recipient of the James Beard Award. He won that last year, 2012, for Best Chef Northeast. It was his second nomination, his first win. His wife, Nancy, is the co-owner of the restaurant and she is the, you know, the energy behind the front of the house 
Tim is the energy behind the back of the house. Together they have created a product that is second to none in the United States of America, probably in all of North America. And uh, if you want to know anything about sake, Nancy is the person to ask. Uh, Tim and Nancy Cushman from Oya Restaurant. <laughs> Next to them is uh, my friend Michelle Nishan, who has got a known him on and off forever. Uh, he's a two-time James Beard Award winner, once for uh, TV work, once for writing. He's the owner and founder of The Dressing Room, the homegrown restaurant which he opened with Paul Newman. He is the CEO and president of Wholesome Wave, which I know he's gonna do a lot of talking about tonight, which is a fantastic organization dedicated to making healthy, fresh food accessible and affordable to all. Um, he works on foundations. He's a member of the Beard Board. You're still a member of the Beard Board? Yes. Um, and is one of those people that for you know folks like me is someone that you look up to and you hope that just a small part of the difference that you make in the world touches the type of impact uh, that Michelle has had. Michelle Nishan. By the way, by the way, his restaurant is his restaurant is in Connecticut, but as we've we've determined, it's only how far away? It's about 170 miles. 170 miles. So that's the circle that we drew around Babson College to bring people in. There, there's a Westport, Mass. We're a sister city. Exa Westport, sister city. Sister yeah. city. This just to give you an idea of how much um, I respect Michelle, and I'm not trying to embarrass him. Uh, but when we first got the idea of doing this panel, the first person that I thought of was to ask him, and I didn't care that he wasn't from the greater Boston area. What's important is not where you are, it's what you do. So I really appreciate you, you. coming this long way. It's my pleasure. Uh, Skip Bennett, the founder and owner of Island Creek Oysters, uh, the champion for sustainable local fisheries, and the star of Bizarre Foods Boston. You've all seen that episode. My friend Skip Bennett, who was gracious enough <laughs> to come down here. And when you talk about entrepreneurial thought and action, especially as it applies to, hey, I'm gonna open up an oyster and clam business. Wait till you hear Skip's story. It really is incredible. I think it's gonna inspire you and show you just how practical uh, food entrepreneurship uh, can be, especially uh, when it comes to creating sustainable models uh, for feeding our planet. Um, and last but certainly not least is my friend Jamie Bissonette, the co-owner and chef of Toro and Copa, has worked with Ken Oranger for years, nominee for James Beard 2012 Best Chef Northeast. Well, I mean, one of you had to win. By the way, <laughs> I, I would have voted for him anyway. <laughs> by, the way, by the way, by the way, I should tell you, the, the way I these- feel a throw down coming. The way, no, no, exactly, exactly. The way these things work, a, a little bit of inside baseball, um, 2012 was my last year to, to vote for that stuff. I was a beer judge in the food category, and the pain of having two people that you really love and admire, both up there, and you're sitting there in front of your computer with that little 20 minute clock going, was absolutely brutal. But anyway, I am thrilled that Jamie uh, could be here. I'm sure you have eaten at one of his restaurants. They certainly are uh, two of the most popular places in Boston. Um, and, uh, and thank you for being here, Jamie Bissonnette. My pleasure. So I, I, I think we'll just throw out a general question and we'll just kind of come down the, the, uh, the line here. So no pressure, Todd, but you're gonna go first on this one. I'm letting you know as I ask it so you can put some, some ideas uh, uh, in your head. And, uh, and get them ready. Um, w one of the things that we hear so much about is the responsibility of those of us who work in the food world um, to, to do some good. Uh, one of the things Len talked about when it came, uh, when he was making his introductory remarks and talking about corporate America was the, what, what I call the art versus commerce problem that so many of us had in this business for so long. We gotta make money in our restaurants or food businesses, and at the same time, we're trying to maintain some standards. These days, I think the, the model certainly that I'm working under in my life is, you know, with the platform, the, the size that I've been given, I have some, some responsibility to do something positive in this world and to make a difference. Yes, I'd like to, I'd like to support my family. More important to me is not sacrificing my principles or my ideals. 
Can you talk a little bit about the choices and the changes that you've made in your life as you've sort of navigated that water? Because obviously doing what, what you do, I mean, you know, fancy restaurants, your, your quote about the Emmys I thought was very informative. Why, why is it that you do what you do and why do you think it's important to be on the farm? Um, I mean, when I first started cooking, I mean, when I, I grew up in New Jersey and I had, until I moved to California, I'd never seen an avocado or a head of garlic. There were three of us, my mom, my brother, and I, and we had a full freezer. We ate everything out of the freezer. And uh, once I got to California and I, I got to understand about, you know, food that's in season and food that's, that's local and, and things that are close by you rather than having it brought in from all over the, you know, the country. One thing I remember in uh, cooking school, we went on a tour of a, a tomato factory that gas ripened these massive warehouses, <laughs> tomatoes. And it just, I, I was shocked. I just, I had no idea something like that happened. And I, I didn't, you know, that's not what I wanted. I wanted, I wanted things that were, you know, real and, and fresh and, and, you know, exciting. And, you, you know, that's everything that we try to do at the farm with the different things that we sell. I mean, you know, things that are on the shelf we want you know, uh, people that are making it local that are trying to start a business and get things going. And uh, at least for me, I mean, that's, that's you know, it, it, it's the purest way for me to cook is, is knowing the guys that are growing it and working with them every day and knowing, you know, what's coming in. What, what's the impact of having a farm in the city? Because that's really the first thing that I thought of when I got out of the car is like, wow, there's a farm in the city. I mean, the city is small. I mean, you don't feel like you're surrounded by skyscrapers walking down uh, the street if you, you know, if you parked a block away. But it's, it's, it's got to be a thrilling thing to see what happens to people when they walk into that place. Right. I mean, you have a couple different types of people. You have people that are just, that eat like that all the time. They want, you know, if they're not growing it themselves, they're going places no matter how far. Well, not no matter how far, but they're going to farms. They're finding what they want that's, that's just picked that morning. And, uh, I mean, if you have that opportunity, whether you're in the city or in the suburbs or anywhere in between, I mean, the, 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 no, the difference is noticeable between what was picked that day and what was shipped from who knows where. And, and, and we all have to do what we have to do. You know, it's, it is the East Coast. You know, mm -hmm. the winter's coming, and it's going to be a little tight. But You, know, <laughs> you when call you, what you have here winter, come to Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Right? Um, but, I mean, the difference in... in what people are looking for is, is wonderful, and it's great that people are searching out farms mm -hmm. and the best that they can get at the season. Tim, Todd was talking about uh, flavor, and he, he mentioned a couple words that made me think of the, the style at Oya. You know, you have a, an art commerce issue. You know, we've, we've talked about this. Um, <laughs> When somebody said, hey, ex-musician, tall, white guy opening, you know, Japanese izakaya, that's got to be the dumbest business model in the history of all business models. Uh, it is, and that's why we didn't tell anybody about it <laughs> before we opened. Uh, seriously. Tell folks about how you came ab about this, because you, you had a, a very interesting, circuitous route towards Oya, oh, yeah, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been working in restaurants for about 33 years now, mm -hmm. and uh, I graduated from Berkeley College of Music. I grew up in Millis, which is not too far from here, um, right on the Charles River. Grew up fishing and uh, hunting, uh, a very natural uh, life. And when I graduated from Berkeley, I went to Los Angeles for the music business to become a rock star. Um, he still thinks he could be a rock star, by the way. <laughs> we st we, st we st uh, still have a He's band, a actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it was a classic story. I didn't have any money or uh, a job or a car, and there was a restaurant down the street. Well, actually, the last year that I was at Berkeley, I worked at a, a restaurant in um, Faneuil Hall called Lloyd Bunbury's which was, I think it was the first year that uh, Faneuil Hall had just kind of converted or right around that time. But anyway, so I was in LA um, and I just slowly, uh, as I was auditioning for bands and, and, and playing, um, I started really liking working at a restaurant. I worked with a, a chef that uh, we were making our own ice creams and uh, you know, it, was, it was all from scratch stuff. And I, I, it took me a couple of years to get uh, convinced, uh, but when I started working with a chef called Michael Roberts, in, uh, in Beverly Hills or West Hollywood uh, called Trump's, uh, with the name of the restaurant. And then Roy Amaguchi, who's a, a Japanese chef, uh, I worked with him, that was around 1982 or 83, and we were doing creative sashimis, and uh, actually at Trump's we were doing uh, raw fish uh, preparations, and 
and just actually the whole multicultural influence of Los Angeles when I was there, a lot of the cooks were, it was just a whole mixed bag. I was, you know, one of the only gringos um, that was around, but that worked out really well because I learned a ton about Mexican food and, and Thai and everything. But then I ended up traveling. I went to Japan and, uh, well, I actually moved to Chicago in 1987. That's where Nancy and I met. And um, um, when uh, in Chicago, I started working with uh, Rich Melman with Lettuce Entertainy, which is a really great restaurant group. And uh, one of the first projects we did was actually went back to LA or Beverly Hills, and we opened up an American diner, diner called, as my Boston accent. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I am from Boston. Um, uh, an American diner called Ed DeBevix, and it was a 450 seat diner, it was right on La Cienega Boulevard. But what happened was, um, there was a Japanese restaurant group that fell in love with this concept. That's my, my voice cracking. <laughs> fell in love with this concept. But anyway, so they wanted, to, they wanted to open one in Japan. So I was lucky enough and went over and helped open uh, at one of these diners in Osaka um, in 1988. And on my first trip, I was fortunate enough the restaurant group that was in Japan uh, kept me on for an additional month and I had an interpreter and a tour guide, and I went and did stages in Japanese restaurants. So I, you know, that, LA was the first exposure to it. But anyway, I'll, I'll speed this up a little bit because um, it's a, it's a long story. So anyway, I'm in, Ch in Chicago working Let Us Entertain You. Um, I was one of the corporate chefs with Let Us Entertain You. We'd go around and uh, or any new restaurants we were opening, and they were always one of a kind. We never duplicated anything, um, and we were doing about three restaurants a year. And uh, so we'd travel uh, wherever, we're, whatever we're doing. We did a Mexican restaurant. We traveled to Mexico, um, Italian restaurant. I spent time in Italy and France and et cetera. We went, went all over the place. And then come back and open the restaurant. So I got an incredible experience uh, working with an incredible entrepreneur, who, Rich Melman. Um, and he always built his company thinking of all the restaurants were uh, a, a school of entre entrepreneurs. Uh, under the umbrella of Lettuce Entertainment, which was the name of the group. So he, and I learned from him, the, uh, you know, you can, everyone pictures you as being wild and crazy and creative and all that stuff, but you need a real solid foundation uh, to, uh, to keep yourself grounded. And it's business. I mean, part of the whole sustainability thing is you're also sustaining a business. So, you know, you really have to know how to, uh, you know, run a business and, and, uh, and do it properly so you can support your, you know, crazy creative ideas. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and that was a great experience to do that and just, uh, and I went back to Japan a few more times. I um, was in Thailand and China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, so I got a ton of exposure uh, from that. So I had, I had 99% made the change over to food instead of music. Um, but anyway, so then we, uh, Nancy's from Chicago, we met in Chicago. Nancy is, uh, was in advertising. She got a great job offer in Boston, so we moved to Boston from Chicago. And we had, we had I'd been thinking about the restaurant for a long time, and it was almost, I, I think I was waiting just for the right timing, uh, I guess in the restaurant marketplace, um, to you know, go ahead and do it. Uh, so hoping it would be accepted, because I'm a, tall white gringo who's <laughs> trying to open a Japanese restaurant. It's like, you just, you just don't go do that. Um, but anyway, so we, we spent a few years looking around for locations, and we actually looked in other cities. We, we really weren't looking for a location as much as a building. And, and because we felt the building was imperative to the experience that we wanted to have in the restaurant. And so we, it took us, I don't know, two and a half, three years um, to, to find the building. And so we found the building. The old firehouse. The old, it's a hundred year old firehouse. Um, so it has a lot of Boston history and I love Boston history too. So it kind of tied into that, my love of Boston and the history of Boston. Um, and uh, we took the plunge. Um, uh, we put our house up for collateral uh, from the, for the bank to get the money. And I spent pretty much my whatever money I had for life savings. And so we took a huge risk uh, with no investors. Um, and uh, and I think that's you know part of the entrepreneurial uh, spirit is that you know we believed in what we did and our motto was always we're not if we can't do it the right way we're not going to do it at all and so it, we were just we were going along and said if we hit a wall then we won't do it 
And we almost didn't open because there weren't liquor licenses available, and we didn't have money to go and pay the street uh, price of the liquor license. Um, so we, we did get a liquor license. Um, we did get open, and the first year was incredibly uh, challenging as I was, we had planned on this. So we had you know, planned on not being busy for, for the first year. And we were able to show the bank with a chart, you know, so see, it's like slowly but surely, you know, we're getting more and more people in here. Um, and it was very challenging, you know, but actually there was one time when I, we, I had to borrow money from my friend to make payroll, because uh, I had run out of money. And actually, no one in our staff ever, I think, knows that, but. Uh, they do now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the, you know, we believe. We've done that. No, we, yeah, we, we raise your hand if you've done that. <laughs> We, we believed in what we were doing, and uh, you know, and we were hoping. You know, it's like we swung for the fence, and um, you know, and if it if it didn't work out, we know we just did it the best way we could, and and uh, you know, we didn't want it to not work out, but you know, it's it just uh, you know, it's very challenging. And then, you know, bam! All of a sudden, we got a lot of press, and um, you know, knock on wood, you know, it's uh, you know continues. But you know, we've been very fortunate with uh, everything that's happened and you know we have a great staff that uh, that you know has helped make it all happen you just don't do it on your own well that Nancy speak to that commitment to excellence because that's something that to me is is basically part of your brand but that's that's also part of what the entrepreneurial spirit is all about I mean I think people who who want to uh, you know move mountains all are are idealists to a certain extent and Tim said, you know, our motto as we opened was do it right or don't do it at all. And it was amazing to find how many moments and how many decision points you had where you could either do it right or you could cut a little corner somewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's faster and cheaper to cut corners. Um, but we knew that at the end of the day that we had to, we wanted to, we had such a vision for what we wanted to do that we didn't want to live and breathe in this restaurant every day and look at something that we made that decision to cut a corner on. So it costs more money and it took more time. And you know, as Tim mentioned, we couldn't get a liquor license um, just due to availability. And, and uh, we paid $35,000 in rent before we could open the doors because we knew that if we opened without a license, you might come in once, but you don't have a beverage to enjoy or sake, like I love. Mm -hmm. and, and you probably wouldn't go back because we've been to restaurants like that. So it was very, very painful, painful at times. And as an entrepreneur, you're going to have many points where, you know, the biggest thing is you need is intestinal fortitude. I mean, as Tim mentioned, we had our house on the line. You've got to, you've got to make every decision count. And even if it's the harder thing to do, um, we'd encourage you to always just pick the right path and, and do, what, uh, do what the right thing is. To do. How do you figure out? I mean, I want to move on to Michelle, but you, you raised a really good point. How do I mean? How do you guys know what that right thing is to do? Do you have a litmus test? I mean, do you bounce the ideas off each other at night? I mean, what's you know what happens? Is it on the drive home? Yeah, we we <laughs> we. I, I guess for us, our vision was so clear for what we wanted to do that we knew exactly where we'd be compromising. Mm -hmm. And, and it's everything, and I'm not even kidding when I say it's down to the, the toilet paper that we have in the restaurant. We buy Charmin Ultra Soft. Yeah. And it's because we wanted My every... son loves it. <laughs> and it's we, important. It's it. it and is. Because, because it's every touch point. You're, you're creating an experience in a restaurant where you're, you all, when you come in, you're the guest. You're like the guest in our house. And we want every sensory moment, every touch, every feel, every sound, everything to be natural and to be welcoming and to be soft and to be just enjoyable. Well, well, and so we don't cut corners. Could we get a cheap toilet paper that doesn't come off the roll and you got to keep pulling and pulling and pulling and mm -hmm. nothing's coming Like out? in Japan. Right. <laughs> right. But, but I use that as an example of that's like, that's a corner that we don't cut. But, mm -hmm. And it's not even anything that you would necessarily think of or notice, but you would notice if you were having trouble getting the toilet paper out of the thing. So yeah. uh, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a lot of things yeah, that you don't make a la laundry list, so to speak, and come in and check them off when you go into a restaurant. But if it wasn't there, you would know that it yeah. wasn't. And we did that with, in our, we have a really small basic kitchen with just a, a fryer, six burners, and, and a grill. And that's all the equipment we have. But we have a, 
sub-zero wine refrigerator in there because we wanted when our service, service staff you know, would go to get the wine, they would feel that quality. And you know, here we have no money, but we're buying like the best stuff. And also the uh, guests, when they're there, they can look in the kitchen and see, and see that. So it's like every little visual thing and every little detail from the handle that you grab on the door when you open up and, and it's like kind of heavy wood and you immediately feel quality. It's like, so it's all those, because we did the design too of, of the restaurant. So, you know, we were in, in the soundtrack and the music. Um, so <laughs> so you're, you're obsessive compulsive control freaks. Absolutely. Completely. He is. He is. So it all balances Correct. out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yes. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, I, I just love the story about how that all came to be. And it's obviously, a, you know, I'm on the record. It's one of my favorite uh, restaurants in the country. Um, <laughs> Switching gears here for a second, uh, Michelle, you spent, you know, a long time uh, and had a career and a half cooking uh, as a as a chef. And at what point? Tell people about Wholesome Wave, and and please tell us at at what point in your life as a chef you said, "Here's what I want my next act to be." Well, it's interesting. We, we have a lot in common. I'm from Chicago, and uh, I was a musician as well. And um, my mom was a musician, but she also was a farmer who could kill a hog and dispatch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could do the same. Uh, deer, squirrel, goats, pigs. Didn't know mm -hmm. what the muscles were called. I didn't know that back straps were loins and ribeyes. Um, but I, when, when I wasn't making it with music, my mom talked me into getting a job in the restaurant so at least I would eat. Mm -hmm. um, I moved really quickly uh, because in, in my family, in my mother's family, cooking was a life skill. It's something that you just had to have. And all of my relatives could cook expertly, all of my aunts, my uncles. And if they met somebody who didn't cook, they thought, how very odd. How are you going to live if you can't cook? Um, so I, I had that. When I started working in restaurants, um, I noticed how bad the food was coming in the back door. I used to work my grandfather's farm in Morley, Missouri every summer uh, until he passed when I was 17 years old. And I noticed how appreciated I was by other cooks and chefs because of my skills, uh, but also how easy it would be to be a chef and kick everybody else's ass because when I became a chef, I would just start working directly with farmers. And in 1981, at the Fleur de Lis restaurant in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my first chef job, I went out to the countryside, which is really only 15 minutes from downtown Milwaukee, uh, to find that there were lots, lots of farms and no farmers. Um, you know, so I, my, my career began with a crusade to figure out a way to try to get my childhood back, those things that really mattered about food, the stories, the, the care, the the importance of different people really owning a recipe and loving it from deeply within for a variety of reasons and how, how to convey that through genuine hospitality. About halfway through the journey, uh, my son Chris, who you met, um, uh, when he was uh, five years old, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, so it was at that time that I went, I was in New York. Uh, it was starting to happen for me. I was working with Drew Neeporn. And, uh, I, I was on a different trajectory and I realized the incredible connection not only to food and environmental and societal and that food cultural health of where did all the farmers go and what did that mean for us and our food future, but then the incredible um, undisconnectable um, command between food and human health. Uh, and I, I learned very, very quickly when you have this significant emotional event where somebody that you love deeply, their life actually depends on what you do with their food for the long-term outcome, changes things. So I opened this restaurant called Heartbeat in 1997. It was a restaurant of well-being based on local, organic, sustainable, and no processed food of any kind. Friends of mine, Josh Wesson, has begged me, he said he was going to disown me if I opened this restaurant because <laughs> it would be the death of me that uh, opening a restaurant based on well-being in the mid-90s wasn't a good idea. And it was... It was by, it, by the way, I should yeah, point out yeah. radically ahead of its time, yeah. I had a dozen people, Lila Galt, an old friend of yeah. ours, I remember calling yeah. me up and saying, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> well... It was rather unbelievable, but it was real. It was there. 
Um, and, and it was pretty remarkable. Yeah. We got a lot of attention. Um, but it was really during that journey, I thought I was addressing this disconnect um, between food and human health. Uh, and the more I studied diabetes to really learn everything that I could to give Chris his best chance at a long-term outcome, the more I learned that people living in poverty actually suffer most from type 2 diabetes. Chris has type 1. A couple of million Americans have type 1. Tens of millions have type 2. The thing that blew my mind about learning about type 2 is that it's actually diet preventable, in some cases early diet reversible, and in all cases diet treatable. What you do with your food could have a lot to do with how much medication you need. And the, the kicker was that I learned that most people that suffer from it live in seriously underserved communities, communities of poverty. And when I looked at that, uh, one day I was standing in heartbeat looking out at all the white tablecloths in the restaurant. Uh, from that day before, feeling really good about what I was doing and I felt incredibly empty and almost worthless when I realized that the only reason why I could do what I was doing in New York was because people could afford to pay $40 for an entree. Um, and it was at that time I was introduced to Gus Schumacher, former uh, Commissioner of Agriculture here in Massachusetts, former two-term Undersecretary of Ag for Clinton, uh, was with Clinton at the time. Michael Batterberry, God, God rest him, introduced us because I was getting ready to throw in the towel and quit and just quit and figure out some way to make a difference. And uh, Gus and I hit it off and we started doing a variety of just nonprofit projects, and it led to the founding of Wholesome Wave. And Wholesome Wave was founded on this premise, and that's that people living in poverty, uh, when introduced to farmers and uh, local food system and the ability to actually afford to feed their families better, that they working with these underserved farming communities can be the heroes of a changed food system. So we have a program where we double the value of food stamps when people spend them at a farmer's market on locally grown fruits and vegetables. That's in 30 states. We have a fruit and vegetable prescription program where doctors, nurses, and, and uh, nutritionists will prescribe fruits and vegetables, again, spent at farmers markets. And then we have a commerce initiative working with these nascent food hubs that are open, popping up all over the place and they're underinvested and don't have the, the kind of business DNA and the technical prowess to, re they're literally about a business plan and a quarter to a half a million dollars away from being a million dollar business to be a five million dollar thriving, vibrant, solution to the sustainable food system. So long journey, um, but, but I really do believe that if we want to talk about sustainability in the food system, if the foods that are raised sustainably by those who steward the earth in a way that's going to make it a better place for it after we have passed, it's got to be available to everybody or it's never going to be sustainable. It's, a, it's an amazing organization. I would encourage everybody. It's wholesomewave.org. Yes. Wholesomewave.org to check it out. Uh, when you get back, it's a great group to be involved yeah. in. Good food for all. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uh, Skip, your your story is, I mean, one of my favorites. <laughs> I mean, talk about the uh, talk about the dream of a lifetime and something that people would say there's no way you can absolutely you can ever do that. Tell them about oyster ranching, wild. Oyster ranching. <laughs> do you need a lasso for? We do. Yeah. Just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the coolest thing in the whole. First of all, first of all, he's he's going to be too. Uh, he's not going to tell you this, um, but uh, Island Creek universally considered to be uh, in the conversation because no one can really say what's the best oyster in America. I mean, it varies from year to year, day to day, even pulled out of the. Uh, same oyster beds, but whenever serious people get around to having the conversation about what's your favorite oyster, everybody mentions Island Creek. So, I mean, huge kudos to you for coming up with it. Like the Cushman's, an unbelievable, amazing product that's second to none, but the story of how this whole thing got started, I mean, you know, you're an oyster rancher. I'm an oyster farmer. Well, farmer, yeah. correct, <laughs> correct. And my farm actually exists in, um, in the middle of Duxbury Bay. So it's, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's about 30 miles south of here. Um, Andrew's been down with us. And uh, I lease three acres of, of um, kind of unproductive land in, in Duxbury Bay. So the whole idea of aquaculture, shellfish aquaculture at least, is that we use these unproductive parts of the bay 
to create jobs, commerce, and most importantly, food, a good sustainable source of protein. Um, the, the, the oysters that we grow, um, they're actually, so as I said, this is on an unproductive part of the bay. Um, when people live in and around the watershed, we create a lot of nutrients that run off into, the, into a bay like Duxbury Bay. So um, largely it's nitrogen, but also phosphorus. Uh, as that, those nutrients enter the bay, one of the effects is that it causes excessive algal blooms, um, which have a whole, whole host of problems. It shades out plant life. Um, it reduces dissolved oxygen so that fish and shellfish can't really thrive in that environment. Oysters are extremely efficient at not only removing the, the excess um, algal blooms, but also the nutrients. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a very unique situation because most of the protein that we we grow has at least some negative cost to the environment. And um, we're actually creating a protein that wouldn't have existed and benefiting the environment at the same time. It, it, it's, a, it's a radical thing. Tell people actually how the, the, the oyster farming takes place because it, it, it really is a very slick idea from seedling to the yearling to the right. wild it's, um, aspect. It's, it's seasonal. We start with um, baby oysters, we call them seed, and that process starts in May. Um, and that, the reason that we start it then is to catch the f whole growing season of that first summer. Um, we used to buy oyster seed from hatcheries in Maine and on Cape Cod. Um, last two years, we've, we've actually produced our own. And uh, these baby oysters, when they come out of, a ha out of the hatchery, they're one to two millimeters. So they're, um, yeah, they look like a flake of pepper. Um, to give you an idea, when, when you hold them in your hand, they're, um, a million weighs about two pounds. And 18 months later, that million will completely cover one acre and weighs about 200,000 pounds. So it's, it's the expansion of that volume of what you can hold in your hand. And really, it's 15 months later uh, that has to be grown out to a point where it can occupy a, a, a full acre. Um, and we grow um, between five and six million oysters a year. It's, it's an incredible thing. How many people now work at the... Uh... Well, there, so it started, actually started as a clam farm. Mm -hmm. um, all my clams died after about five years. You were a lousy clam farmer. I was terrible. <laughs> it, it was early on, though. And, and you know, one of the in interesting things about um, shellfish farming is it's, in terms of farming, it's brand new. I mean, you know, really 30 years that this has been going on, 30, maybe 35 years. So in, in this country? Of, yeah, in terms of of farming this brand new. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it really, you know, I, people say, well, how'd you learn? I said, I, I killed a lot of clams. <laughs> <laughs> killed a lot of oysters. Um, but anyway, the, the, I switched to a, um, growing oysters back in, in 95. And uh, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really an amazing thing for me because I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, oysters, I wouldn't necessarily call them a alternative protein, but the, the fact of the matter is that we're living in a world where our growing choices are becoming limited, resources are running out. So to me, it's that entrepreneurial spirit of saying, hey, I'm going to take something that otherwise is just gonna sit there and be fallow, mm -hmm. for want of a better expression, and we're gonna create something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think it's, I just, I love, I love my time spent at, at, the, at the farm because it's, I love being in a place that would, otherwise left untended would have just been nothingness. It, it's, it's really the inspirational place. And for anyone who hasn't been, they, I mean, obviously you, during the summertime, folks can come out and see what you guys do, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep, we have tours that come out on the weekends. And, yeah, uh, and a big festival, a big uh, party every year, do. right? So um, I actually, I kind of had a, a moment like Michelle where I was, um, I had the chance early on to go to uh, New Orleans for a trade show down there. And I met a guy who was running a hatchery in Maine. Um, I actually knew him, but I'd never really hung out with him. And we got talking about, well, how, how did you get into it? And my, my dad was a lobsterman, fishing family, and there were no farms where, anywhere near where aquaculture farms. So it was, it was kind of a strange process of getting into this. I asked him, and he said, well, I, I dug fish ponds in Africa for the Peace Corps. 
And I had that moment where I was like, that's really cool. Like, I'm, I'm selling oysters to Le Bernardin in Manhattan. They're four or five dollars a piece. And what am I really doing to feed the world? So um, I, th I always had that, that thought in the back of my mind that it would be really cool to do, do something where we were actually producing food to feed people. And um, we had kind of the marketing side of Island Creek after September 11th, we couldn't give oysters away. And um, we really knuckled down and we, we started doing a lot of events in, in the city with uh, Jamie and a lot of the other chefs and uh, kind of realized we were onto something that not only were we out with the chefs and marketing our product, but it, it also felt good to give back. And mm -hmm. uh, the festival that you were asking about was kind of a natural progression of that. We, um, we did a little festival out behind a restaurant in Duxbury and had a couple hundred people there. And, um, I started to realize that we had the potential to do something much bigger. And sure, Gregory, who's here today, we, we, uh, we started a foundation and actually had uh, about 3,500 people on Duxbury Beach. And uh, we raised $150,000. And we start, so we have this foundation that supports aquaculture programs in, in countries where they need food. So yeah. we have a, we're built a shellfish hatchery in Zanzibar. In, Tanzania, mm -hmm. and uh, we support a program in, in Haiti, a fish farming program. It's amazing. It, it is the kind of knowledge that can be spread and dispensed around the world. Okay. You know, and that's, that's what's so amazing about what you do. I mean, I've had a chance to be in a lot of countries where they're literally drowning, uh, sorry, they're, they're uh, dying of thirst on an ocean of spring water. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Namibia has one of the largest and most fertile, you know, uh, coastlines in the world, the, the water there is so rich and the, the, the seafood that comes out of it is so incredible and the Namibians have no way to access that as to make it a growing part of the economy. Big giant multinational European and Chinese corporations are down there doing oyster yeah. farming and you know the, the guys who were carrying our bags across the, uh, across the uh, Namib desert uh, we're given these small little fish for dinner while we were served all these great and amazing foods. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't have any of that when we were there. And I walked out behind the tents and I went to have dinner with them. And I said, what are you eating? They were all embarrassed because they didn't want to be seen to be eating this horrific trash fish that they were given for free um, in exchange for their work. And I opened up the chest to see what these trash fish were. And they were stunning. I mean, caught with a net 15 minutes beforehand, uh, Aji, horse mackerel, uh, which will sell for about 35 or $40 a piece in a, a restaurant in New York or uh, Tokyo or Los Angeles, um, or perhaps Boston. And uh, I, I absolutely flipped out and I said to the guys, this is trash fish? And they said, yeah, there's millions of them. And so I explained to them what their value was and how precious a food commodity they were. And the guy pointed out to me, we have no airports. Mm -hmm. We have no refrigeration and no electricity. We have no way of getting this into the food system. So for those of you that, the reason I bring it up is that many people are, you know, think that we're running out of- opportunity. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> an incredible amount of work. We yeah. have a lot of food. It's a, distribution, uh, it's a distribution issue in many cases. Anyway, I digress. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Jamie Bissonette, uh, chef at Copa and Toro. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you here was talk a little bit about, um, talk a little bit about pork. Pork? Yeah, if you will. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's not a euphemism for something. Um, one you of the, don't mean that as a verb. No, 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 of course not. Uh, we, we, we've known each other for a while now. Um, you have a very serious point of view uh, at the restaurants about what you bring in, what you cook, what it represents, mm. how you want to process animals, and I think the philosophy, everyone has heard about snout to tail dining. I think we finally have turned the corner where we no longer have to codify it and we no longer have to think of it as being sort of the precious food that we eat in fancy restaurants. I think that eating whole animals has now been democratized and the economics of it have started to sort themselves out yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I I if you would, tell us about this process and the changes that, you know, in your, in your years in the food business, you know, for, you know when you came in uh, to the, your cooking life till now, how has your you know, relationship in, you know, with food, 
with the farmers and use pork as an example, perhaps, because it's something that you're sure. famous for working with and certainly at the restaurants you guys do a lot with. And tell folks about the, the food programs also at uh, Copa and Toro as you're moving through your, your lesson. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I got into cooking because I was uh, also a musician. I was touring with a straight edge. <laughs> wow. well, I, I feel a band <laughs> Later tonight at the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, when I was touring with a straight edge hardcore band, we were all vegan, and whenever we would have time off, uh, I got more into cooking and trying to figure out what we were going to eat and didn't really care about practicing. Got kicked out of the band. <laughs> <laughs> Happens. Uh, we weren't very good anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, a young age was about 17 years ago, and uh, I was kicked out of high school as well, and I grew up in, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. My mom would drive past a farmer's market to get to the grocery store so she could get <laughs> you know, Swanson family meals or whatever. Um, I didn't know that you could make fried chicken without opening up a box of fried chicken. And, and I was con you know, curious, and as a vegetarian and vegan for a long time, I got really into cooking and, and learning about food, and um, through the Hare Krishna religion, got really into Indian food, and then was like, hey, I'm gonna go to culinary school. They'll take me with a GED, and that's what happened. And uh, flash forward a lot, I'm not a vegan anymore, I'm definitely omnivore. Um, <laughs> That kind of stopped when a chef told me if I wanted to be a real responsible chef and be talented and one day command a kitchen where people would respect me as a, as a real chef, not a vegetarian chef, I should probably be tasting my food. <laughs> and uh, it was very, very, very poignant. And that's what happened. So flash forward to Boston now and well, actually flash forward to back to Hartford, Connecticut, working in really crappy restaurants and watching the food that came in and everybody of you know the early 90s, the same foods were coming in. It was a box of tenderloin of pork and you know broke, everything already broken down and I would say, well, where is this coming from? Where, where can I find the pork tenderloin? You know, back, exactly back scraps. Like, I didn't know that. I thought it came out of a box. You thought it was scraps. It was just like the opposite juxtaposition of cooking and I kept asking questions and researching and reading and teaching and then I traveled and staged all around the country and went to Paris and you know, worked with butchers and you know, eventually realized that pork was not the other white meat. There was so much more flavor in the animals that were coming in whole from smaller farms versus coming out of a, a box. The box had more color than the pork did and I thought this was something wrong and <laughs> it turned out I was right. <laughs> And, uh, You're on to something. Yeah. And I, I, the, one of the, the things that I think, feel is happening with whole animal cooking, and you know, people call it nose to tail, snout to tail, you know, I just call it being really frugal and cheap. Like, if I can make money off of pig skin, mm -hmm. I'm going to make money off of pig skin. I'm not going to throw it away. And um, using a whole animal is definitely a commitment. It costs more money. You're using, um, you know, you could buy crap pork for $3 a pound, where you can buy a whole animal for 6 so you're, and you've got waste, so it's, you really have to be more um, concerned with what you're going to do with it and you know, kind of plan it out well, and it's not for everybody. But mm -hmm. I feel that you know, if you look at somebody like Brady Lowe who has the Cachon 555 brand, he says, you know, when I have kids and my kids say, hey, I wanna go, to the I wanna go get a, a dog, you're not gonna say, do you want a small, medium, or a large dog? You're gonna say you want a breed of dog, right? Well, the heritage breed of pigs were totally going by the wayside because of factory farming. And it's chefs like us and, you know, who say, hey, I want to use a Tamworth pig or a Mulefoot pig. And, you know, the different personalities that the farmers tell me that these animals have. That, you know, none of my farmers will raise Berkshires anymore because the Berkshires kick their kids. But everybody likes to have a, you know, a red waddle because they're like a big fat pig that just like wants to cuddle and snuggle with you. Mm -hmm. You know, and those animals taste better. I don't care. It sounds cheesy, but they do. No, it's, it, it, it is absolutely true. I mean, I've had the opportunity to taste pig breeds all around the world. And, you know, even when you're breaking them down and you feel the fat and you taste some of their organs raw, I mean, I'm not trying to be dramatic. You can actually oh, it's taste true. sweetness and taste difference. You know what you're eating is good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, whole, I mean, that's whole foods. I mean, I think that's what we all are, are trying to represent um, in our different lives is that, you know, a whole, a whole food, W-H-O-L, feeds this holistic lifestyle and it's sustainable from an environmental standpoint, an economic standpoint, and probably most importantly, a cultural standpoint. Um, I wanna save some time uh, for questions from the audience. So I wanna do a rapid fire round for a couple minutes. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask a question and I need a fast, I'm gonna need a fast answer. I'm gonna need a fast answer. Uh, but I know that you guys are all up for it. And we'll get through a couple of these uh, and then turn it over to uh, questions from the audience in a couple of minutes. Um, 
Todd, what influences you these days? Where do you get your inspirations when it comes to uh, your work? Watching the farmers bring in whatever they picked just then. That's, that's, that's how I decide what I'll make that day. Tim? Um, I think everything. I mean, I pay attention to everything that's happening uh, in the world. I, I mean, I love strong flavors, so if it's a, a new hot chili or something, but I, I get magazines from Europe and Asia and uh, the U.S. and newspapers from all over, so I'm paying attention to what's going on all over and, you know, try to uh, just keep uh, current. So it's kind of a general answer, but... Um, no, no, no. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it's a, I'm the that's, same way. I'm a bright, shiny objects guy. I mean, i got to collect it all. I need it all around <laughs> me. Nancy? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? What, ins <laughs> what, inspires <laughs> what, what influences and inspires you these days? Um, I think... I think what we try to do at the restaurant is really look to how people are dining and, and kind of the change in dining and, and, and what products people are looking what for. What do they want? And it's not just in a restaurant, but in the stores and, and how do they shop and how do they think and what are they, what are they, what are they looking for that we could give them, but also in a way that also challenges or kind of so provides something new. As entrepreneurs, I just want to make sure I understand you, as entrepreneurs and business owners, it's not so much what's going on in restaurants. It could be what kind of, you know, fabrics are selling Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Anything in the, in the world. It's the, mm -hmm. how, the response to the new um, iMini today. You know, sure. it's just anything. Like, how, how are people kind of responding and reacting to different things in their lives? Because yeah. we as a restaurant want to become part of people's lives, too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, yeah, tr changes that we make are based on what our guests want, not on necessarily a trend, but it's like we just get, we are very much in touch with what people are eating and what they want and what they ask us for or need from us. And so we try to, you know, as best we can uh, ad uh, address that. Yeah. Michelle, what influences you these days? Where do you get your inspiration? Um, I, I, I get it from the communities that uh, we work in at Wholesome Wave. Uh, I get a lot out of the restaurant, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I love food. I love cooking food and feeding people. But uh, to go into um, really seriously challenged urban, rural, north, south, east, west, midwest communities and see that when you provide access and affordability at the same place, mm -hmm. that way more people than you would think really are desperate to feed their families better, that there is not this, this incredible void of education and lack of knowledge or lack of demand for food. The demand is there, um, that, that these folks who are really struggling to rub two pennies together to feed a family of five, um, when they have one thing that they can improve their, their family's life with, and it's food, the explosion of that is really humbling. And some of the recipes that I've seen in these communities where people are supposed to not know what to do with fresh food are some of the remarkable, most remarkable foods I've ever eaten. Yeah, yeah. Skip, what, what influences and inspires you? Well, we, um, we actually, we're really fully integrated now. We're all the way from the farm to the, to the table. We, in the last couple of years, we, we opened a restaurant in Kenmore Square. And uh, that's actually been a really big inspiration on the farm. It's challenged us, um, you know, to create new products off the farm and, um, or a spin on kind of just the regular oyster that we grow. Um, so it's really been, you know, kind of within that's been, been challenging us. There's, uh, like I said before, it's a really new industry, so it's hard to find inspiration outside of, of what we do. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going out to the West Coast, where the industry's been a, a, around a lot longer out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really excited about seeing the farms out there. Cool. Jamie? I think, for me, traveling and just seeing mm -hmm. new things, whether it's a new restaurant or going to a small village somewhere in you know, Thailand or 
going and traveling and seeing other chefs and, you know, where I see you mostly at big events and just, you know, taking peers and asking them questions and seeing what they're doing. And I think that, you know, as cheesy as it may sound, social media has had a really good presence for a lot of people with seeing what other chefs are doing. You can see what somebody's doing at a small restaurant in Hawaii that's doing similar food to somebody in Chicago just from pictures on Instagram and it creates dialogues and you create these, like, connections where now I'm emailing and talking to people that I'd never physically met before and we're trading recipes and talking about how we like to process fresh horseradish. Sure. And it's, it's really passionate. This, this is a true story. It's like, I don't know, what, when were you in Southeast Asia? Nine months ago? Yeah, last uh, March. Yeah, last March. Jamie is traveling. He's 14 hours ahead. It's like three in the morning and I get up to go to the bathroom and I come back and I'm typing something on my phone and my wife starts screaming at me because I woke her up and she's like, you're on your phone. It's the middle of the night. And I looked at her and I said, Jamie needs a place to go eat tonight. He's in Bangkok. <laughs> she did not think it was funny, and she likes him. Uh, last question, and then we'll go to, uh, go to our, our, uh, our Q&A um, for a couple of minutes before we unfortunately have to close. Um, if there had to be a, a product, or if you could invent a business, something that you feel would change something for the better or address a need that you feel needs addressing, what would it be? Huh, that's a good one. Um, I, I mean, I, I work on a Wave farm. Wave your magic wand. Yeah, yeah, I, I work on a farm. I want, I want, more, I want you know, more attention to the farm. I want the farms to expand. I want, I want more of this beautiful, fresh produce for everybody. I mean, it's, the difference for me is, is blows me away, and I want everyone to be able to have that. I want it more accessible to everyone. My, my magic wand is to, is to reorganize the American food system. It's to decentralize it and get back to where we have more companies, more farms, more food production on smaller scales that's regional as opposed to national. Right. So I'm, 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 I'm with you. Tim? I think um, very similar. I uh, feel the same way. It's, um, you know, growing up as a kid, in the 50s and 60s, uh, we, things were done, you know, you did pickling, you know, you <laughs> did uh, things. We had a garden, you know, we grew potatoes and kept them in our cellar. Um, and it's, to me, it's very encouraging to see the younger cooks now, everyone's like pickling and smoking, and, and, and that's really just the way it was before. It was just and, and, and yeah, and so to me, it's like, oh good, we're getting back to that, you know, because I was like, I, you know, making relishes or whatever, and, and just doing so many things from scratch. Uh, it, it's great to see you're making, you know, maple syrup or everything that's that's happening. But I think it's it it makes it better quality. But I think it makes it more accessible to more people too. And you know, a, a magic wand, I guess, would be to feed everybody. Um, you know, and ha I mean, there's enough food in the world so that everyone could eat great food. And I think you know, if there was one big wish, it would be able to do something like that. Nancy. I wish for consumer revolt, almost, to what the grocery <laughs> store looks like today. Revolution. Because if you look at the grocery store and all the aisles, they tell you to shop around the perimeter of the grocery store, and that's where all the good food is, everything in the middle is junk. I mean, it's all processed and just really, you know, it, it would be people demanding more from their stores even, and, and more of, a, but accessible in, at a price point that's accessible as well. So mm -hmm. that probably has many other layers to it as far as distribution. Mm -hmm. Education is a huge part of that. I would wish for more like mandatory almost food education so that, mm -hmm. so that kids don't grow up thinking that mac and cheese is a dairy product. It's not, and, and I think it, it, it's just, it has to start young and it has to, you know, it, it has to just, I, I would like to see people just eating more naturally because I think a lot of what we put in our bodies is just not good for us and is leading to a lot of other illnesses and things and just, if it were more accessible and, and better, you know, priced in a lot of uh, situations and mm -hmm. if the bigger, rest, uh, bigger um, stores, we're proponents of that. I think it could change a lot of the way America eats. Michelle? Um, I'm gonna riff off of what you said. No, um, we're, we're in a business school, right? And um, we all understand efficiencies of scale and what that can mean for growth and for economic development. 
Um, but, but I'm going to say uh, we, we took food way too far. Uh, we got really big. Yeah. Uh, we do have billions of people in the world, so there should be some big, but it should be a few big, millions of small, and less millions of mid-sized. When we look at um, the economic value and the difference between conventional cereal and oil seed crops, corn, cotton, rice, wheat, and soy, and the economic value of fruit and vegetable production, it requires more help, it requires more diversified equipment, there's business opportunity to build the infrastructure there, uh, it requires less, trans it demands less transportation, more local and regionalization. Um, we, we won't find a utopia where we feed the billions and billions with all small, but we need to get back to what is size and scale appropriate for today. And uh, what, what is gonna actually provide the jobs for people that are living in poverty that actually, if we didn't so dramatically change the food system, probably would all be working on farms right now. Um, in, in the 30s and 40s, we repurposed 20 million Americans away from the farm to fuel the Industrial Revolution because we found a model where we only needed 2 million farmers. Um, we need to get back to 20 million farmers. It would take care of the job deficit that we're talking about. And my magic wand would be remove shareholders from the food system. They don't belong there. Shareholders belong in businesses where their investment can drive the types of technologies that can help us have an iPad mm -hmm. and, and communicate with each other all over the world. The only way you can continue to guarantee a 10% return for investors in the food system is by cutting food cost and labor cost. Yep. And that's not good for any of us. We see the results, the obesity, et cetera, et cetera, remove shareholders from the food system. They don't belong there. <coughs> Skip? Sounds like food's taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, switch it up and say energy would be mm -hmm. yeah. um, to resolve kind of our energy crisis now. Um, I have a cottage that's really pretty remote on the end of the beach, and um, I'm completely off the grid. So I have a full-size refrigerator, and it all runs off the sun. That, you know, it's all solar. I don't think we're that far from it. Um, obviously, storing energy is really a big challenge now in um, you know, figuring out how alternative energies can work with the grid. Um, but I think it, the other scary part in this is uh, so the, something that we talk a lot about is ocean acidification, where uh, everybody always thought, or kind of the common school of thought was that the, the ocean would be the great consumer of, of carbon and that we wouldn't see a, an impact from it. Well, it's actually changed the chemistry of the ocean now. And, uh, there's places where hatcheries used to work, they don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the higher pH, or I'm sorry, the lower pH actually um, will erode the shell as it starts to develop. And um, it's a real, I mean, it's a, a much bigger problem in our food industry than people are talking about. Yeah, it's, it's the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that needs to be talked about, but it's even moving some of the largest school fish to be found in the oceans mm -hmm. anywhere in some cases, removing them from our site and others shifting them into places where they're eating other fry fish that they shouldn't be eating. Right. It's one of the big natural disaster stories that you're gonna hear more and more and more about is ocean, ocean acidification. Mr. Bissonette, what do you, wave your magic wand, what do you wanna see out there? Well, being a city guy, I like, I really enjoy living in urban areas. Um, and one of my best friends, Courtney Hennessy, has been working on a project that I would like to see like go all over the world, rooftop agricultural farming that can help with waste and water runoff that helps saving energy on air conditioning because it cools and then in the winter time, it helps save money on heat. Mm -hmm. It provides jobs, it provides more localism, and I, and I just think it, it can bring so much. And you know, if anybody, I'm gonna plug it right now, if you go online and look at a um, higher ground farm out of Boston, it's Courtney Hennessy and John Stoddard, and they're really gonna revolutionize, not revolutionize, but help revolutionize. Some other people have done it, Brooklyn Grange, but I wanna see more of that. I wanna mm -hmm. see more, and I'm not talking about a little farm to support a restaurant, I'm talking about acreage and acreage over different rooftops that can you know, really make an impact in, in cities, and especially in, in impoverished areas. Your turn. 
We have a microphone down here. We have a microphone over there. We have time for a couple of questions. Is there someone who would like just, if you could, just let us know what your question is and throw it out to whoever on the panel you'd like to see answer it. Well, I guess it has to, it'll go for anybody in the, on the restaurant side of it. First, full disclosure. I'm one of those big guys. I, I, we work with, our company has 4,000 associates. We make beef and chicken. And so you look at it, it's massive operations. They're huge. Our closest one, the one that I'm directly associated with, with is up in Portland, Maine. So I, I listened to what you, you were all saying, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, we've got to do something about food security for the people of the United States and what we're doing. The question is, you, you're all in this higher end of restaurant tour ship. The people that our company deals with are a step, you know, they're, they're not the top end guys. They're not the trend makers. They're, they're, they provide the people, the, the average Joe, with the food that they need. So, you know, when you, when you look at the restaurant industry, you know, the, the, in order to make a small fortune in the restaurant business, you've got to start out with a large fortune. You know, that <laughs> generally seems to be the case. So what do you do about those mid-level restaurants? Help me out with that uh, because I, I struggle with it. You know, that's our business. It's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, so, I, 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 I'd like Michelle? to take a first crack at it. Yeah. I think, yeah, w one of the difficulties is um, it, just a combination of, of marketing and other, um, the other inputs over the last five or six decades. But uh, we, we really have a skewed uh, societal view as middle Americans uh, on how much protein we should be consuming. And um, it's... Uh, when I started in the restaurant business, I was blown away that, that the idea of a gourmet meal was actually a steak the size of your torso and a baked potato the size of your head. Um, now we've got, gotten down to a steak the size of your fist, opened up a little bit, and, and a baked potato about the same size. Um, we, it, it, it's a long road, road to hoe. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, for, for the small and the middle guys, any step towards sustainability that can, they can take. You know, choosing hardware, like a lot of people say, well, I can't afford to go organic. It'll price my menu out of the market. But what you can do is you can afford what I call the hardware, potatoes, onions, carrots, celery. Uh, they make it into vegetable dishes. They make it into stews. They make it into clam chowder. Uh, they're the least expensive crops to grow organically. And you can put those things on your menu and actually start making a difference in volume. If we got um, just, you know, a hundred of the customers of the size that you deal with, because some of these, I'm, I'm going to guess these are, you know, restaurant associate type restaurants that can serve 1,500, 2,000 covers on a Saturday night. You get a few of those restaurants just buying a few things organic and the footprint can be huge. But I think, you know, um, riffing on what Nancy said, we need to really help Americans understand you really only need about four an ounces of animal protein a day. If you think about the need for concentrated animal feeding operations, if you think about the problems with sustainability in the oceans and the amount of fish that we're depleting, it's because the norm has become a 12 ounce salmon steak on the plate when we really only need four ounces. And we need some really great lentils and black barley and some other stuff and some tat soy that was grown by the Khmer growers of Western Massachusetts. If we get people to understand that rearranging the plate will reduce obesity, will reduce a lot of these other diet-related diseases, it costs us about a half a trillion dollars a year, um, we, we can start shifting it. But I would encourage your customers and have enough of a product portfolio where they could take small steps at a time. You get enough of them to do that, and it, it could be a game changer. I, I, I can think of many, many growers in Western Mass that would love to be part of your portfolio if they knew that they could really move the volume of hardware. Yeah, I'll throw in there before we go to the next question, which unfortunately has to be our last, alternative proteins as well. I think that's, I think that's the, you know, we're, we're just, we're eating from too narrow. Over the course of the last hundred years, we've just narrowed our- You mean like bugs? Uh, <laughs> people in America will not do that in my lifetime, but I'll tell you right now, since I started doing my show seven years ago and talking about things like goat or even squirrel, squirrel's becoming popular and it is, Fantastic, one of my favorite meats. Uh, last, last question. Someone want to take a crack at it up top or over here? Come down here, young man, ask your question and uh, 
How you doing? I'm first year here at Babson and uh, have a background as a musician as well as in food. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Music obviously. and food, by the way, have a lot of relevance. I, I think so as well. Yeah. Um, so basically, I was working uh, for a socially conscious uh, company called Two Degrees that basically gave one pack of food to a starving child every purchase of a health bar. And after restaurant week this past year, I was eating and I was uh, thinking about how we could incorporate that one for one with the restaurants. And I kind of wanted to ask how you would feel and how um, kind of local high-end uh, Boston restaurants would feel about getting a week, a day, a month where a meal was donated. Not necessarily the same meal, not oysters or sushi, but something where it's actually a tangible, uh, healthy uh, meal for a poor, starving, health hungry person. Not across the country or across the world, sorry, but locally. So you're actually encouraging people to uh, eat local and create value locally for those less fortunate. Great idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are the, I mean, just very, we just have a minute, but Tim, why don't you take a crack at it? And Jamie, you have 30 seconds. Is that something that's feasible in a restaurant? I mean, because obviously the, we, we all would like to see that great idea. And then there's the implementation of that. Is that something that is feasible in a restaurant? No, I, I, I think it's a, a great idea of actually had an idea of, uh, that I've had for a long time of doing, um, uh, have a, a group of chefs and rotating chefs come in and do kind of like a soup kitchen mm -hmm. thing where, and you're utilizing products from the restaurants or, uh, and I got that idea from when I was working with Lettuce Entertaining, we used to get all kinds of food in, uh, people would just want your business so they'd send in a, uh, six number ten cans of tomatoes, sure. and with all this stuff, you know, and I'm and I was thinking, you know, I wanted I wanted to call it then because there was a couple guys that were in the uh, the restaurant group that had been with Rich for a long time, and there was no place for them really uh, it, because the restaurant had grown so much, and I wanted to open up a restaurant and call it the Untouchables because they were untouchable in the in the restaurant group, and I thought we could utilize all these products, but I think you know there's w different ways of thinking of that of utilizing a lot of waste that is in restaurants and, mm -hmm. and incorporating it and maybe opening you know, a restaurant that where it was a rotating group of chefs or something. Jamie? Yeah, I think that's a great idea, and I'd sign me up if you want to do that. <laughs> um, I think another, another kind of variation of that is something that a good friend of mine actually does called Love and Spoonfuls, where she goes around and she takes the leftover food from anywhere from a grocery store that doesn't want to sell the tomatoes because they don't look perfect, uh, they were just throwing them away, but Lo Love and Spoonfuls is a uh, Boston-based food rescue operation that's run by a good friend of Jamie's and mine. Um, and one of the things that, you know, if actually if I could take that magic wand again, I would tap it onto the, the National Health Department book and open their eyes to, to realize that we know what the heck we're doing. And mm -hmm. if they just trained themselves, they would realize that what we want to do is feed people healthy, quality food and the restrictions and the handcuffs that they put on us prevent us from taking and doing exactly what you just said. I can't make a, a meal every, if I had a dish and I said, if you buy this dish, I'll make exactly that same dish and I'll package it up and I'll deliver it. Well, if I do that, the health department makes me have a HACCP plan for how I'm going to deliver it. They tell me that I need to have a certain <coughs> permit and I need to store it in a certain way, which of course we're going to do, but then they have to come in and inspect it and say, you know, we're not going to grant that to you right now. Okay. So I would love to do that they're, exact thing. They're regulating the wrong end of the process. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a great place to end because what Babson represents is entrepreneurial thought and action, which I always, you know, synthesize into the, you know, just do it phase. Don't think about it, just do it. Ask for forgiveness, not for permission, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much, everybody. A big round of applause, Todd Hairline, Tim and Nancy Cushman, Michelle Michon, Skip Bennett, Jamie Bissonette, and by the way, as, the, uh, as one of Babson's entrepreneurs in residence, the first ever Food Soul aprons are yours as our way of saying, yeah, you get an apron. All right. Ooh, suck your lente. Exactly. Yeah. One of a kind, never before taken anywhere. Thank you very, very much for coming. See you next year.